So my presentation has to do with thesis in neuroscience involving uh, consciousness uh, in mice. Um, and consciousness is a very interesting, uh, highly debated idea. Um, ideas about consciousness kind of fall into two camps. Uh, phenomenal consciousness, which is the kind of total intangible uh, nature of consciousness, and access consciousness is a more narrow definition of consciousness, which has to do with the processing of specific information. And so if we're trying to metaphorically understand the, the difference between those two types, um, you, you have this image here, which is tons of different little stickers. And on one hand, there's the whole kind of just all of everything there. But it's very likely that you find one sticker that for whatever reason stands out to you and you focus on it. And what you're focusing on, what you see specifically, would be what the, what the access consciousness is. Um, things you're using and processing specifically. And whenever it comes to uh, neurological studies of consciousness, it's a lot easier uh, to focus on access consciousness. It's a, obviously a neural question, but um, it also uh, more likely has a neurological substrate to it. And so the question becomes, how do specific stimuli, for example, a certain sticker enter access consciousness? Um, and you, you could say maybe a certain sticker there is important to you, Maybe you have an affinity for a certain brand. Maybe it's a, just a color that stands out. Um, whatever it is, it needs to be significant. And whenever it's significant enough, uh, you can imagine that it enters a kind of network of these sort of significant parts of uh, stimuli that make up consciousness. And uh, this kind of line of thinking has been developed into the global neural workspace model, uh, where there's a subset of neurons throughout the brain that take in sensation and all the inputs from kind of your brain state and unify them into this sort of globally accessible arena of information that's broadcast throughout the brain to allow further processing as well. And um, ignition in this model is whenever something uh, enters the workspace. So for example, whenever there's that one really like important sticker to you, um, it becomes important enough that uh, whether it's your attention or your evaluative systems, or maybe it's a memory, they combine such that the perceptual content of that uh, is elevated, made significant, and enters the workspace. And that, that's called ignition again. And so the question, uh, if you're trying to you know, gather experimental data, you want to have a result, how do you influence it? And so to see the result, you want to influence the output, uh, which would be in the you know, motor systems, just generally the outcome uh, of the workspace. And you want to find a way to influence it, right? So looking at evaluative systems, that's very hard. Um, it's, it's very complicated, very nuanced, um, distributed. Um, so we're going to roll that out. Long-term memory obviously is also very, um, deep. There's lots to it. Um, and it's also hard to, another thing that we want to find is, is a way to kind of reliably push in a button, uh, I guess, to control the output. And that's hard to do with long-term memory and perceptual systems. Uh, you can influence the result but you require a lot of control of the environment. And so when really, whenever it comes to interventions, attentional systems become the most attractive option um, for figuring out a way to influence this uh, global workspace of consciousness. And so the issue then is that we don't know uh, what controls the attention input in this model. Um, however, we do know that acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter that does highly relate to attention um, in different studies. And it has its own network, it influences alertness and attention, and in humans, uh, this kind of node of, of this uh, neurotransmitter that influences attention is found in basal forebrain. And um, can, given that we're trying to do experiments here, um, it's a bit you know easier to start with mice. And mice have a correlate of this um, area as well. And so putting it together, the idea is if we can look at this basal forebrain area, it will influence, we can maybe change it or whatever, It'll influence uh, the attentional systems, which then will change the output, and that'll give us different behavior. And we can glean insights about the workspace and, and the nature of it. And so how can we test it? What we need to know then is the activity in basal forebrain and the behavior that, that's kind of the output and see what happens. And a key thing is that you need a both of those things in high resolution over time. This is because um, the nature of ignition um, is very short um, over the scale of a few hundred milliseconds. Um, your brain gathers the, the visual input um, and has a quick feed forward wave, and then you have some feedback processing, and uh, it all happens under a second. 
And the traditional methods um, that we use for looking at um, regional activity like fMRI, those are at a pretty high time scale of over a second. So we, it's very hard to get the kind of right information. Uh, however, um, we do have an alternate method. Oh, and also, yeah, another point to mention here um, is that th these kind of activity correlate measures are based on the idea that more blood flow means more activity because whenever your neurons are being more active, they're burning more calories, they're higher metabolism, they, they need more support, and so there's more blood flow. Um, and that's also important out in the data. So we need a different method that uses this kind of blood measure, but is not fMRI. It's faster, also higher resolution. And the solution that we have in our lab is functional ultrasound. And ultrasound works by sending out sound waves. They bounce off of whatever you have in front of it, and then they go back to the uh, receiver. And it tells you information about the density um, and distance of whatever it's setting. And so if we put the um, ultrasound over the mice and we create a window in the school so that the school is blocking everything, we can actually get these really uh, wonderful high resolution um, images of the blood in, in the mouse brain. And we can also see how the blood flow changes over time. And this uh, information we're getting is at a faster time scale. About 200 milliseconds is about how fast you can take each frame uh, of a functional ultrasound image. And so it solves a problem and we can use it. And uh, we're talking about basal forebrain again. So we can focus on a specific area of the brain here and use that as our kind of data set for the basal forebrain activity. Um, then back to the other part we need. We got the basal forebrain stuff, but we need to look at behavior and figure out how it relates. And so we need a task that tells us if a mouse is conscious or not. And the kind of general way to do this is to give the mouse some kind of stimulus. Um, it could be maybe if you use a monitor, um, some kind of like light, like a dot, that's very barely discernible. Maybe it's a little bit too bright and then they see it for sure. Maybe it's so dim that they can't really see it. Or maybe it's a uh, puff of air that's very strong and they feel it, or maybe it's not strong and they can barely feel it at all or not feel it. And so the mouse has the mouse is given a stimulus and it, it uh, will either consciously sense the stimulus or it won't. And you wait to give the mouse enough time so that it isn't habituated. And then you tell the mouse to answer, did, did you see um, or feel the stimulus? And if the uh, answer matches what we presented, if, if it lines up, then you reward the mouse. So you incentivize the uh, actual answering. And basically, this is kind of a scheme that allows you to figure out whether or not something was consciously uh, perceived. And so we have that part. And we can uh, use this to kind of split up the behavioral results, the different groups, and then look at the base forebrain activity in each of those groups. And you can find two correlations. And the last thing that we need is also a control um, because ultrasound data is pretty new for basal forebrain. Um, it's relatively deep in the brain um, and uh, blood flow is useful, but it does have time delay itself. And so we also are checking the uh, activity basal forebrain with a camera, a laser illuminating the pupil, um, and then taking images of the pupil um, at a high frame rate. Um, and this is because the pupil is also related to basal forebrain. Whenever you have high levels of um, activity there, um, pupil dilates because you're more aware. Um, on the other hand, it'll contract whenever you're more drowsy. And we can use all these images with an algorithm to measure the length uh, or it's the diameter of the pupil um, and then get a measure over time. And putting it all together, we, we have your activity over time, we have the pupil diameter, we have the status of the test, um, where we are for each of those things in time. And we also have the type of test. And um, a very basic hypothesis that we have is that, um, for example, in uh, trials where there is, uh, the mouse does perceive the stimulus, whether it's the light or a touch or something, whenever it does perceive it, whenever it's conscious of it, there is higher basal forebrain activity um, at following the stimulus. And so the current state of the research is that we're still working on it. So we're putting together all the stuff. We've kind of got the different parts coordinated. We're still troubleshooting and gathering data. But on the, good, on the other hand, the, the good thing that we've done is we've, we've established a framework for head fixed functional ultrasound studies. And it can be a kind of rephrased for different sensory modalities, which is why I've been kind of vague about it, is you can use a monitor, you can bring in air puff, you can bring in um, for example, poles that the mouse tries to sense with its whisker. 
you can do all sorts of things and you can position the ultrasound in different parts of the brain to look for different kinds of activity. So it's uh, kind of a useful paradigm that's been uh, developed here. And all these um, results that kind of use that framework will help inform the global neural workspace theory. And that in turn helps inform understandings of consciousness. And if we have better understanding of that, then maybe we can begin to find new approaches to disorders of consciousness. For example, uh, patients who are locked in, how do we know in, in a coma? How do we know if a coma patient is conscious, but they can't move or signal versus a coma patient that is totally unconscious? Um, maybe if we um, have a better understanding of the GNW, uh, we can look at certain ways to test that. So it could be helpful in the future. And um, that's it. So thank you.